Let me tell you a little story that illustrates and accents, I think, what we're all up against these days. And by the way, during this session, you don't have to take any notes whatsoever. You can sit back and relax. Pretty much everything I tell you is going to be provided to you before the end of our time together. So if you can just take in the big picture of what's being said, then I think it'll work for you. So this is going to be a fun session. You don't have to uh, you know, be on the edge of your seats or anything. Let me give you a little story. When I was 21 years old, I took the proverbial trip to Europe. I had the URL pass. Did the whole thing. I finally got to Spain and I wanted to do something different, so I booked an overnight passage to the Balearic Islands. How many are familiar with the Balearic Islands? A few. Alright. Now I wanted to go to Ibiza or Mallorca, right? But all the berths on all the ships to those two islands were full. There was no passage to Ibiza or Mallorca. So there was one other island. What's the name of that other island? Menorca. Menorca, that's right. So I figured, Mallorca, Minorca, Major Orca, Minor Orca, what's the difference? I'll just go to the small island. It'll be fun. So I paid my $6, that's what it was back then, and took the overnight passage. I slept on the deck. My backpack was my pillow. The stars in the sky was my ceiling. And in the morning when we arrived, we could look out over the ship and in the distance see the island. And, we, and as we got closer and closer and closer, we realized, I realized, there were no buildings above two stories. Been there. As we got even closer, I realized there were no roads, there were no highways. It was all just footpaths and dirt trails. And I got off the ship and I walked up the path with all the other passengers. And I came to this small ring, like about the size of a high school track, and realized that this was downtown. There were no hotels. There were no McDonald's. There was nothing. I couldn't even find a place to stay. I could walk around. I realized in a hurry I was the only person on the island that spoke English. Everybody else spoke Spanish. And this wasn't tourist Spain. Well, I finally found a second floor room, pension, Uganda, whatever they call it, where somebody rents out the space and you, you stay. Shared bathroom, all that stuff. Now I get to my room, I unpack the few things I have in my backpack. I'm thinking to myself, oh brother, I am stuck on this island for two and a half days and there is nothing here. But I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm an American. I'm going to make the best of this. So I find a map. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate a well-developed sense of humor when I find one. It's so rare these days. I find a map of the island, and it turns out that it's not that much to walk the whole thing. Two, three hours, you can circumnavigate the entire island. So I figure, okay, not that much to do, that's what I'm going to do. So I put on my flip-flops, I put on my bathing suit, and I put a towel around my shoulders. No hat, I had a lot more hair back then. No water, no Evian, no Perrier, no Deer Park. We didn't do water back then. And I make my way out the door, past the track, find the path. With the ocean to my left, I'm walking along, and it's quite nice, it's pleasant. Every time you turn, there's another ocean vista. I'm going along for about an hour now, okay? Now, this is the Mediterranean sun, not the Parsippany sun, the Mediterranean sun. It beats down on you in ways you can't even detect. After about an hour, I'm woozy. I'm starting to really, you know, wobble here. I mean, I've never been in the Mediterranean sun like this before. I'm protected in any way. Now, I'm walking down a hill, and out of the blue, three of the most wild, vicious dogs you can imagine come right in front of me, right in front of my path. These are not New Jersey dogs. <laughs> These are not Greenville, North Carolina dogs. These are wild Menorcan dogs. <laughs> and they're drooling like this, and their coats are grizzled, 
and they get on their hind legs like this and they're ready to pounce. You can see them. And they're lined up. There's one right here, there's one right there, and there's one right here. I'm standing here, and an aerial view would form the peace symbol. But I felt no peace. <laughs> now I'm looking at these dogs, there's no help in sight. Nothing. There's not a stick, there's not a stone, there's nothing. I'm thinking to myself, this could be the end. They, they're going to pounce. I take the towel from the back of my neck and I wrap it around real quick, make it look like a rat towel. <coughs> a weapon. Rat tail. That you hit, you know, you're in the locker room with your buddy, you hit him on the side. Well, I'm holding the towel like this. And I'm buying what, folks? Seconds? I'm buying seconds. These dogs are ready to pounce. I'm standing here. I have no clue. I'm not going to say my life flashed before my eyes. It didn't. I was 21 at the time. I hadn't lived that long. But I felt an incredible sense of sadness that my parents would eventually receive the news. That I died or was mangled on this island. No hospitals, no antiseptic, no nothing. I'm standing there and the seconds are ticking by. Each second is an eternity. They're going to pounce. And then, coming down the hill where I had just come, a man in a broad brim hat, just like you might imagine in Spain, with this colorful shawl, comes running down the hill and he's yelling, and he's got a stick. And he seems to know the dogs. He comes up behind one of the dogs and grabs it by the back of the collar. And he brings it over to the side of the road and he opens a pen. For the first time I couldn't detect all the leaves and vines and so much was covering it, so much brush, that there's actually a crude pen there. He opens up the gate and he puts the dog in the pen. He comes back and he gets the second dog and he does the same thing. Now I'm standing there with one dog in front of me. I'm thinking to myself, hmm, in 30 years this is going to make a good story. <laughs> I didn't think that. I'm standing there because I know even one dog can still do great damage. He comes back, finally he gets the last dog. Now all three dogs on the pen. I decide, I make an executive decision. I decide I'm not going to continue circumnavigating the island. <laughs> I don't want to know what's around the next corner. I head back up the trail. I should have been Overwhelmed. My heart should have been beating at 5 million beats per hour, but I was so woozy, it didn't really register. I knew I needed water. I made my way back up the hill. I look back, and the man yells out something joyously in Spanish, and I say something not so joyous in English. You take off, and I make my way back to my room, and there, I am basically a prisoner for the next two and a half days because now I am so sunburned, I am so fried. I am a crispy critter. I can't stand up, I can't sit down, I can't take a shower, I can't dry off. I can't go outside if there's even a ray of sunlight beating down. I can only go out at night when the sun has gone down and listen to them playing guitars and music. And it's quite a nice little village I discovered. But that's all I can do. I can go out at night for a little while, and I mark my time, and finally, mercifully, after two and a half days, the ship returns. I get on board, and I head back to Spain. Now, flash forward to today. We are faced with the hounds of unrelenting change, the hounds of too much to do, the hounds of increasing time pressure every place we turn. And the first thing I want to tell you right now that you absolutely must take back with you, and if this is all you get from the entire session, it will be worth it, is this. The unrelenting time pressure and stress that you feel is largely not of your own doing. It is, if I may use the ten-penny word, a socio-cultural phenomenon that impacts everybody in every society who holds any position of responsibility. It's not because your organization, your department, your division, your sales team, your sales manager, your territory, 
It isn't because in particular those represent such great obstacles. Everyone in every sales organization, or for that matter, everyone in accounting or insurance or in research or even in government who has major responsibility, who's raising children or caring for aging parents or managing a household or taking care of other things in their lives, professionally and personally, everyone, every place is experiencing the same phenomenon. But what many people don't realize is that it is sociocultural. It's more a function that you were born in the 1940s or 50s or 60s or 70s. Uh, we have anybody born in the 80s? Okay, good for you. <laughs> It's more a function of when we were born and what we have now encountered as opposed to any personal shortcoming, any personal failure.